Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. There are lots of announcements in the bulletin to draw your attention to. Um, last last uh, Tuesday, we had the election here at American, um, and some I called some at the very last minute to bring cookies because because um, Bertha mentioned it on the way out of church, and we almost forgot about cookies entirely. So, so anyways, we got cookies set up for the election and, um, and treats afterwards, and the people who came had missed them so very, very much for the last however many elections we had during COVID. So the answer to that long story is cookies are back on at elections. And mark your calendar now because we'll probably need cookies for the next election. And even more than that, we need visitors. So if you have the gift of gab and can sit and drink a cup of coffee and chat with anybody who comes to sit next to you, that's your job. And we need somebody to do that because that's what I like to do best in the world is sit and have coffee with people. But I don't have a whole day usually to be able to do that. So I need a few friends to help with that job. Gladys says she's on for next time, but she needs about two more friends too. So start thinking about it now. I'm putting out the call. We only need, so about a year away, hopefully. Okay. It was fun. So fun. <laughs> um, and it's a really good way to be good neighbors in our community. So, um, other announcements. Today is Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Packing. Um, that's happening in the fellowship hall right after worship. If you're able to, come and help pack some shoeboxes. Um, and a huge thank you to everybody who brought boxes and who brought things to fill them with. It's kind of fun, you know. Um, folks bring in package. Folks bring in things for the Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Packing. Kind of all year long. It, it, they just sort of trickle in. And then suddenly we pull them out of the closet and it's like this, I don't know, like this closet that never seems to empty. And then there's, and, and all the tables get filled. So um, come and help pack. Um, and then it's cold and Christmas is on its way. And so if you would like to give a poinsettia in memory or honor of a loved one, um, there is a there's a flyer in your bulletin this morning to, to um, make a donation and to, to write information about um, who you'd like to give it in memory or honor of, and we need them by the 27th of November. So if you'd like to do that, you can put them in the offering plate or um, you can drop them off at the church office. Um, and then don't forget the chili cook-off is next Sunday. Um, if you haven't sent out your postcards yet, this is your week. You have to get them done this week. Five postcards for each person, okay? Um, and next Sunday is also the youth group's bake sale. So, um, so they'll be having bake sale um, in between worship services if you'd like to participate in that. And next Sunday, Lutheran World Relief that I told you was going to come in October, they're coming, yay! So, the, um, so they'll be here to share a little bit about the ministry that, we're, um, that we participate in through World Relief, where we send our quilts and the, um, the health kits that we made at Lent, and they do a variety of other things too. So we'll, we'll get to learn a little bit about their ministry, and they'll share the gospel with us, and um, maybe give us some updates as to what they're up to. Okay, I think those are my announcements for today. Oh, one last one. If you volunteered to write an Advent devotional, they're due today. So um, this is a good chance to get that done. Other announcements? In our prayers today, we hold Jack Farrell. Jack was in the hospital with pneumonia um, this week and is out and recovering, but I don't know. I've never had pneumonia, but I don't think it's a lot of fun. So keep him in your prayers. Others? And let's begin our worship. We rise, we confess our sins, and we hear God's promise of forgiveness and grace. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who redeems us in Christ Jesus, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and our neighbors. 
We have ignored the voices that call for your justice. We have neglected actions and witness through your righteousness. We have spoken and acted in ways that disrupt your beloved community. We truly repent of these things we have done and left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Restore our troubled spirits so that we may live in newness. Follow the way of the Spirit and build up the body of Christ. Amen. Rejoice and be glad. God hears the prayers of all who cry out and restores us to life through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I declare to you the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
let us pray. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without you nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Embrace us with your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may live through what is temporary without losing what is eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading comes to us from the book of Malachi, the fourth chapter. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. The word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition that they receive from us. For you yourselves know you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were there, and you will, we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked day and night so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because we did, do not have that right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this commandment. Anyone unwilling to work shall not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. The word of the Lord. Gospel, according to Luke, the 21st chapter. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be torn down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, the time is near, do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For these things must first take place first. But the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nations will rise against nations, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand 
or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But not a hair on your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace and peace to this day from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It took 80 years, 80, to build the temple that Jesus is standing in with the disciples in our gospel reading this morning. Most of the people who were alive at the beginning of the reconstruction of the temple were dead by the time that it was completed. Though the stones of the temple were thrown down in roughly 70 AD, 30 years after Christ's death, the stones that once formed the base of the temple can still be seen to this very day. And they are roughly the size of a school bus. A school bus. They're made out of white marble. Most of the rocks were, and they were lined with gold. And when people saw the temple sitting high up on one of the highest hills in Jerusalem, they could see it from a long ways away because when the sun reflected off that white marble and that gold, it was visible. But it looked like it practically blended into the sky. And when people looked at the temple, they thought that they were glimpsing perhaps heaven itself. That's one of what one of the writers wrote about it. So the people who have come to the temple to worship are there to worship God. But there's the tourist factor too, right? Have you ever been to a magnificent cathedral? And yes, you're there to worship, but somehow you didn't hear a thing that was worshipful because you were drawn to the building itself and all the architecture? I think maybe multiply that effect times 20. And we have an idea of what the people may have felt when they stood next to Jesus and they looked at this temple in that time period when there was nothing modern to build that temple with. Imagine it. They're looking around and they say, wow, look at those stones. Look at the tapestry. Look at the gold. Look. And Jesus says, do you see all those stones? I tell you, the days are coming when all of them will be thrown down. Not one stone will remain on top of another. Can you imagine it? What would it take to tear down a temple like that? What would have to happen? Something terrible and cataclysmic, something that maybe might shake heaven itself. Or at least it would feel like that had happened, right? But when the people listen to what Jesus says, none of them ask, how will this happen? Did you catch the question? Nobody says, how? How will this occur? All of them say, when? When will this happen? I wonder why. Why not ask how? Maybe because they know. Maybe because they know as well as we do that virtually anything terrible can happen. 
and does. The temple that they're standing in is a reconstruction. The first one was maybe not quite as amazing, but almost. And some thought that it was better than the one that they're standing in now. And that one was torn down over 500 years before this, when the Babylonians marched through and destroyed it. And when they did, God's people were sent off into exile and lived as slaves for years and years and years until the Assyrians came back in and sent them all back home again. And somewhere along there, the temple began to be rebuilt. They all know that it can happen. They don't remember how it happened, but they've all heard the terrible stories. And we know it can happen too. We know it doesn't even take much, not really, to do cataclysmic change in a community or even a country. All it takes these days is one kid with a really sad story and a really messed up psyche or I don't know, maybe just crazy amounts of wrath and anger and a slightly competent weapon. And he can shake us or she can shake us to our core. We know this because it's happened a whole bunch of times this year and last year and the year before that. Right? It doesn't even take nuclear war for this kind of thing to shake us we can be shaken easily. Very. We don't ask how. We can all figure out how. What we want to know is when. When will this happen? That's the question of the gospel. When? Why does it matter when? If you know when, you might prepare, right? When a snowstorm is coming, this is the silliest example in the entire world, but it's cold outside, right? When a snowstorm is coming, the weather people will tell us a week in advance. There's a snowstorm coming, and when they tell us, we prepare. Suddenly, you can anticipate that the grocery store lines are going to be longer, and so will the gas lines, because, well, everybody wants to make sure that their gas can is filled, especially if they have a snowblower, because the neighborhood is going to be requiring their snowblower. So make sure you have gas for that snowblower, right? And maybe travel plans get changed so that you don't have to be out on the road in those cold, snor stormy weather. And maybe travel plans get canceled. And we make preparation. And the doctors and nurses are set on alert and told, don't plan on taking these days off because we're going to need you in the hospitals. For something as small as a snowstorm, when we know when, we prepare. So if you knew when, how would it change things? If you knew when, the temple were coming down. If you knew when the cataclysmic was about to happen, if you knew when the second coming of Christ would occur and life as you knew it would change forever, how would you live differently today? Would you put some relationships to more importance than others? Would there be things that you just didn't care about doing anymore? Would there be some I'm sorry's, some I love you's, that you'd go out of your way to make sure got said? Would you save differently for your retirement? If you knew when, what would it change today? Potentially all kinds of things, right? Because we are people who like to prepare. If we can prepare, then we think that maybe we control, can control the uncontrollable. Don't we? 
Isn't that it in the end? If we know when, we think maybe we can be in control even though we're not. But it doesn't really work, does it? Jesus says, don't worry. He doesn't answer our when question. Not ever. But he does give us some advice. He says, first of all, when somebody tells you they know when, don't listen to them. They don't know. They'll mess you up. They're most likely preaching a false gospel. And then he says, when the storm comes, don't necessarily even think that it's the end at that moment. The temple fell a long, long, long time ago. You can still see the stones of its falling. Now the Dome of the Rock sits on top of it. The when of heaven and earth changing forever hasn't happened. Not yet. When you hear of all these things, don't necessarily jump to the conclusion that it's the end. Instead, live in the now, Jesus says. When you're facing the terrible, don't even bother preparing. It's really interesting advice, right? Don't prepare the sermon. That's what Jesus says. I have never listened to him. I had a seminary professor said that Jesus says that in the gospel, but he really means that on Sunday morning you should prepare. You know that's coming. There is a when, right? When you're facing the unexpected, don't worry about preparing in advance. Don't make a five-point plan. Don't set everything that you think you'll need 100% in place. It probably won't do you any good. It'll probably waste the time that you should be doing something more important. Instead, Jesus says, hold on to what matters. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. So instead of preparing every last thing, pray. Pray and trust and know that God will see you through it. God will nudge you with what you need at that time. Your sermon, the Spirit will give you one that you couldn't come up with on your own. Don't worry so much about it because the Lord will somehow provide in the midst of the storm. Instead of preparing, listen for the Spirit's nudge and then follow it. Follow that little tiny nudge. It won't tell you where the end of the road is going or it never has for me. But it will give you that next step. And then you repeat the process, right? Pray some more. Another step. Until slowly but surely you follow the Lord down whatever road God is leading you on. And it, in the end, might be even better than you could plan. Who knows? but it will definitely see you through the storm. Know this, Christ ends with. Even though it's entirely chaos, and even though you can't see any of it coming, and even though I'll never tell you when, know this, you are my beloved children. I have loved you always, claimed you, and I will never let you go. Not one hair on your head will perish. I'll hold you tight. God has more to keep track of for some of us than others, right? But 
God will hold us and not let us go. So, hard as it is, follow the nudges. And you never know where the Spirit might lead. Instead of giving up when everything falls apart, most likely the Spirit will encourage and guide us to be a part of the reconstruction, the rebuilding, the new life. How many people have changed at least a small piece of the world simply because they listened to the nudge of the Spirit one time? I used to babysit a little girl named Brita. When I babysit her, she was tiny. She threw a fit. She grew up. All the kids that I babysat have done that. It's kind of an annoying habit, really. <laughs> but anyways, Brita got to be about eight or nine years old. And she was sitting one day in Fayed class, and she went off to play, and she realized that the friend that she was sitting next to didn't get off the bleachers to go play. Because she didn't have tennis shoes that were required for playing in the gym. And she found out that she simply didn't own them. So she went home and she told her mom. And she said, I have an extra pair of tennis shoes. Can I give them to my friend? So she did. And the mom found out that there were other kids in the school with the same story. So the little girl and her mom started working on it, started spreading the word. Pretty soon all the kids at school could play in the gym because shoes shouldn't get in the way of that, right? And the next thing I know, because the word got out and because there was a little nudge from the Holy Spirit, at the right time in the right place, more nudges happened, right? The next thing I know, there's the kid I used to babysit on the national news telling people about Happy Feet. Her project to get shoes for kids who didn't have them. There are lots of ways to help. But that one touched her heart at that moment. How will the Spirit open your eyes and touch your heart? The world will be as terrible as the world is at times. But you are children of God. You are held in God's arms. You have been filled with the light of Christ. So in the middle of the storm, don't worry so much about the when. Don't worry so much about the preparations. Instead, pray and listen and watch, and pay attention. And when you feel that gentle nudge or that gentle tug at your heart or that gentle whisper in your mind, pay attention and act. Take that step and follow the Spirit. And who knows what God will do? Amen. Thanks be to God.
confess our faith, we use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Merciful God, our salvation in whom we trust, you who are eternal, know our daily joys and sorrows, and give us grace to bring our needs before you. We pray for pastors, teachers, and all the saints who lead your church. Inspire them by your Holy Spirit and help the church's faithful to uphold them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for elected officials and civil servants. Stir, stir them to heed justice and rouse the church to hold them accountable. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick or in trouble, especially those that, carry, that we carry to your hearts today. Comfort them with grace and empower your church to minister to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who suffer the violence of human hands or natural disaster. Shield them with your holy angels and motivate your church to care for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for children and for the defenseless. Protect them with your care and strengthen your church to tend to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who live in fear of your judgment, who have no one out of fear and in, who, who have no one rejection, who live on the margins of society. Show them that love casts out fear and enable them to find a place in your church, that we may be a community of reconciliation Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our enemies. Empower the church to love them and to look for a day when we will live together in your reconciling love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, our strength and our might, receive these prayers, which we entrust, which we offer trusting in your goodness. We ask in weakness according to our need, but you give wisely according to your gracious care for the world. Therefore, we pray in gratitude and in hope through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please turn to your neighbors and share that peace today.
Please rise as you're able and let us pray. Blessed are you, maker of all things. As you have entrusted us with all that you have created, now gather our gifts, nourish us with this sacrament, and send us to those who hunger and thirst for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The meal is ready and all are welcome. Please come forward and receive God's grace, forgiveness, and love and be fed by the presence of our Lord.
pray. Receive this blessing. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you forever in his grace and love. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, most gracious God, that you have fed us through the bread of heaven and given us a foretaste of paradise. Enliven us with your body in the, with your body in the world and, serve to, and to serve those who are in need. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We are sent out to love and serve God with our lives. We go with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.